welcome everybody. Great to see you this morning. Um, welcome to Christ Community Church online viewers. Today we're continuing in part two of, of the series Perspective, looking at the book of Philippians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. As we look at this book, we're, we're going to see many references to, to the mind and to how we think. And so I'm asking today that God would, would change our perspective that all, all of us together as a church, that he would change how we think today. And the great theme that we discover in the book of Philippians is, is joy. But within the context, it's, it's obvious that Paul's not referring to, to a joy that comes from, from getting your way all the time. It's not a joy based on your circumstances, but it's a joy based on knowing who you are, knowing your purpose and your identity in Christ, and it's that kind of joy that we find expressed in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, last week, we talked about joy being a, a choice that you make, a habit you develop, knowing that, that God is always with you, that God always has a plan for whatever you're going through, and that God is so good that he can take whatever situation you find yourself in and turn it into something good. That was, that was how Paul could find joy in the, in the midst of, of difficult circumstances. Because he knew that God was working in it all to bring about good, even, even when he couldn't see, even when he couldn't understand why. So Paul's positive attitude truly reflects his divine perspective. And yet what I want you to understand is that this doesn't come naturally. This is, it's, it's an acquired habit. It's something that we develop. And so, so today we're going to talk about the, the joy of serving. You see, that there are times in our lives when the, when the old self is going to rise up. There's times when the old man is going to, going to resist to what God wants to do in your lives because it, our old self doesn't care about others. It doesn't care. Its only concern is for itself. And deep inside all of us, we have this natural tendency to, to take the path of least resistance. Believing that pleasing ourselves, doing what pleases us in this moment, will bring us lasting joy. But I, I think and I, I hope we, we all know that this isn't the case. The truth that we find in God's word is, is that true lasting joy comes when we learn to give ourselves in service to Christ and in service to others. Paul described his life this way to, to Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I'm being poured out. You know, you, you may be familiar with the show. It's a, there's a, a TV show called, called Hoarders. You know, they, they film the personal lives of people who, who refuse to throw things away. You know, they, they live their, their, their lives with stuff piled everywhere. They, they climb over stuff. They, they, there's no place to sit, no place to eat. They just um, have this small path where they can get through their home. Some will even stockpile food, keeping it past the expiration date, long after it's spoiled. And so what happens, the, these counselors that come into, come into the homes, and, and they try to help these subjects to work through their, their attachment issues. And you can see the difficulty these people have, the struggles they have, and the inner turmoil as, as they're coming face to face with their inability to, to let go of anything. Today, I'd like to suggest that, that some of us are hoarders. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're a, a money hoarder or maybe a relationship hoarder, a situational hoarder. But whatever it is, we selfishly and stubbornly cling to whatever we think will bring us joy and refuse to let go or, or give back to anyone else. We take and take, always looking for what's in it for me. 
Yet in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul shows us a completely different way to experience joy. We're going to see him talk about what our attitude is and how when we change our perspective, it gives us a different way of thinking and we can experience the fullness of joy in life. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this, beginning to verse 1. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Now Paul says, make my joy complete. Because he's saying, to put it into context, he's saying, I, I've been your pastor. I've been your teacher, your spiritual leader. I poured my life into you. And nothing makes me happier than to know that you're doing well. That you're living the life God called you to live. And when you live together in unity... I'm filled with joy because it indicates to me that your spiritual life is right on target. You see, the, his whole reason for living was to build others up, to encourage them so that they would come to trust Christ, becoming fully devoted disciples of Jesus. That's why in Galatians chapter 4, he said, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you. And what he's saying is that I'm, I'm struggling, just as I struggled to bring the good news of Christ to you. I'm struggling so that you could be saved, and now I'm struggling again, just like I'm in childbirth, to help you to become mature in your faith. You see, that was the most important thing to Paul, to help them, to encourage them, to build them up, and to see that they were doing well. And so number one, he encouraged them to change the way they think and to be like-minded, to be like-minded. He said, make my joy complete by being like-minded. You see, Paul knew that the way that you, do, you think the way you think determines what you become. In fact, one of the things that I've, I've heard repeatedly in, in church leadership conferences is, is that you don't copy what other churches are doing because we, we, we don't all have the same gifts. We don't have the same talents and the same calling. But what you want to do is, is, is to find out how they think. You want to discover what influences them and to try to understand the thought processes in their minds. If then you can begin to think like they think in your own demographic, with your own resources, with your own gifting, you can successfully apply those things to what God has called you to do in your own ministry. But let me ask you a question. Let's, let's bring this home and make it personal. How, how would you finish the sentence? Make my joy complete. By what? What would you say? Make my joy complete by maybe doing this project for me. Sending me some money. Buying something for me. Maybe giving me some recognition. Making my life easier. What is it that will make your joy complete? Paul says that it was seeing those around you, or that it should be those, seeing those around you doing well, seeing them living well, seeing them getting along, seeing them growing in Christ, seeing that they experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And the reason this makes your joy complete is because you know that you played a part in making it happen. You know that you had some influence in the lives of those people. And so Paul's attitude was, when I see you walking with the Lord, I'm filled with joy. Because I know that I did what God called me to do. 
And I can tell you that one of the things that makes my joy complete is seeing my son Matt or my, my daughter Megan serving Christ. One of the things that makes my joy complete is seeing young people like, like Brandon, who I baptized so many years ago, now serving the Lord. One of the things that makes my joy complete is seeing my brothers and sisters in the Lord that are, that are studying and, and being serious about serving Christ and even, even preparing to enter the ministry. I could go on and on, but you get my point. If you want to experience the fullness of joy in your life, start looking at your life in terms of the good you've accomplished in others. Start living your life with the goal of being a positive, eternal influence in other people's lives. Finding ways to help them experience a closer walk with Christ. Helping to encourage them, to, to build them up in their faith so that they're united with Christ, that they're comforted by his love, that they would be in fellowship with his spirit and always one in spirit and purpose. You see, for Paul, everything was about Jesus. And he, he, did, he didn't just want them to think like each other, but he wanted them to think like Christ. That Jesus Christ would be that common denominator, that common strand. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he goes as far as to say, but we, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And this is so important because it, if you think like Jesus thought, you'll find yourself living like Jesus lived. So number two, your attitude, the way you think, the, affects the way you act. You'll be one in spirit and purpose. That's God's desire for you. You see, Paul knew that if you had the mind of Christ, if you thought like Jesus thought, if you're empowered by the Spirit of God, you can actually live like Jesus lived. The Apostle Paul said this exact same thing. I'm not, not Paul, the Apostle John. John said the exact same thing. 1 John chapter 2. He says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Now, we, we know from the Gospels that Jesus thought about a whole lot about pleasing his father, right? He thought about pleasing God the Father and loving people. You know, one time he was asked, of, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And in Mark chapter 12, he said, this is the most important one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And so the principle that Paul was teaching is that Jesus was all about pleasing God and loving people. And if you'll be like-minded, if, if you'll refuse to think like the world thinks, you too will be one in spirit and purpose. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind, thinking and living like Jesus. And so Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 at verse, verse 3, he says, Therefore, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude, the way, the way you think, affects the way that you act. It affects the way you live your life. Your, your attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. It can change the course of your life. It, it changes your relationships. But, but notice Paul, Paul didn't just say have a positive attitude. But he said you should have a Christ-like attitude. A Christ-like attitude. Look at verse 5 and following. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now we're we're all we're all quite accustomed to to having a worldly attitude, because because we we live in the world we live in these tents. But this is a totally different way of thinking. No longer is it about promoting ourselves, improving our game, having more Facebook friends or Twitter followers. This is a paradigm shift. This is the, a, a different way of thinking because the kingdom of God is a radically, totally different way of thinking. Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And this is so important because equality with God is not something that we should desire to grasp either. Jesus said it this way. John chapter 13. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. But if you remember, that's exactly what that fallen angel Lucifer saw in Isaiah chapter 14. He, he said, I will make myself like the Most High. And again, when he came into the garden in Genesis chapter 3 to tempt Adam and Eve, he said, when you, when you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. The temptation was that, that you can be like God. But both Paul and Jesus knew that equality with God the Father is not something to be grasped. That life is not about self-promotion, but it's about a giving up of the self, of relinquishing self, of, of being one in spirit and purpose, and living in the fear of the Lord. Jesus said it this way. He said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. So we lose our life in Christ to find that Christ's life is in us. And therefore, our attitude should be the same as he who made himself nothing. Jesus, who being in the very nature of God. John's gospel tells us that he was, he was in the beginning, that he was with God, he was God. But Jesus gave up the glory of heaven. He stripped himself of everything to become a servant to those who sinned against him, those who would crucify him. And though he had every right to be worshipped, even though God had put all things under his power, he would kneel and wash the feet of the, of the lowest of the low. And he would make himself as nothing. Now, I want to make sure you get this because the, the Holy Spirit is trying to, trying to tell us this today, that, that as, long, as long as you don't consider equality with God something to be grasped, as long as you're nothing, God can make something out of you. But when you start thinking of yourselves as something, when you start thinking of yourselves more highly than you ought, that, that's when you're at risk of missing God's calling for your life. You see, Jesus made himself nothing. He giving up the glory of heaven, the praise of the angels for a time because he had a different perspective. He didn't come to promote himself. Matthew chapter 20 tells us the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Therefore, it's about you and I saying that, that my life is not about myself. It's, it's not my own. I've been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and my life is now all about him who made himself nothing. And number three, the one who took the very nature of a servant. The very nature of a servant. Now, I want you to notice that's exactly the way Paul introduced himself at the beginning of this letter. Chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul and Timothy, 
servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ. You see, he, he didn't introduce himself as the apostle. He, he didn't give his credentials. He didn't talk about being of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He said, I'm a servant of God, and I'm here to serve you. Paul was devoted to doing the will of his master, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who made himself nothing so that he could become a servant, and that's the attitude that we should have as well. If you and I could just begin to start seeing ourselves as servants like Paul and Timothy did, if we could just see ourselves as Christ saw himself, if we could have any encouragement from being united with him and any comfort from his love, any fellowship with his spirit, any tenderness and compassion, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, in humility, considering our others better than ourselves, and having the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, it would transform not only our lives, but it would transform our world. You see, a servant is not, is not what we do. A servant is who we are. And God has called us to represent Jesus everywhere in this world. It's a totally different way of looking at, at things. Our, our perspective needs to drastically be changed. Because it's not just an expression of who we think we are, who we want to be, but it's an overflow of who we are in Christ. Matthew chapter 20 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then verses 8 through 11 tell us how, how just exactly how he served. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, that's what our Jesus did, and our attitude should be the same. He, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He was totally devoted to the will of his Father. Now remember, Paul is writing this letter from, to the Philippians from prison. He's in jail, he's in chains, chained to a Roman guard. He doesn't know what the future holds. There's a chance he could die. He could give his life. He could be executed for the sake of the gospel. And so Paul really has two options. First, he, he, he could dwell on what might have been. You know, he could think of the life he could have had. All the what ifs, you know. What if I just had an easy nine-to-five job, you know, a wife and kids, maybe a couple pets? He could have thought about the success he might have had with the money he could have made. Or the second option, he could, he could look at his life in the perspective of eternity, in terms of heavenly rewards. And, and, and what he's accomplished that would, that would truly last forever, that would not be burned up in the fire. Paul chose the joy of serving Christ, knowing the joy of self-sacrifice. And said in Philippians chapter 1, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. As we close, I'd like you to consider how Paul, a man who was chained 24 hours a day to a Roman guard, could say this in Romans chapter 8. I consider 
that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You see, you can be sure that there will be times when you'll be called upon to make sacrifices in your life. Maybe sacrifices at work, sacrifices in your relationships, even sacrifices in your walk with God. There's going to be times when you're going to choose between the world and God, between the approval of God or the approval of your peers. There's going to be times when you're asked to give only so that others can reap the benefits. And you can choose to find resentment in this fact. Or you can find joy in it. I encourage you to look at how your life, your actions, and your work benefits others. And take joy in the good that you're able to accomplish for others in Jesus' name. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. How could he say that, you might wonder? Well, if you begin thinking like Jesus thought, you can begin living like Jesus lived. And so it's really about a change of perspective, adopting a different attitude, having a heavenly mindset, and saying that it's not about me, but it's all about him. It's about Jesus Christ who said in Mark chapter 10, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You see, there are all, all of these reasons that Paul, that you or I could be miserable. You know, we have that choice. You know, I, I don't have this or this isn't fair. I wish this were different. Or why didn't God do this? I deserve more than this, and on and on and on. You know, how, how can we be happy in a, in a world this bad? How can I be joyful when life isn't playing out the way I expected it? Paul gives us the answer, saying in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. My joy is not based upon what happens to me. My joy is not found in my circumstances, but what God is doing in me and through me for eternity. See, it's, it's, it's a change of perspective, and that's why Paul could say in chains, even knowing that they might execute him. In verse 17, even if I'm poured out, even if, even if I have nothing left, I'm poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. Coming from your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. Paul says, I'm glad. Because it's, it's, it's not about me, but it's about Jesus. And he says, I'll, I'll gladly lose my life to find it. My joy is found in who he is and what he's doing in me and through me. So Paul says, you, you can lock me up, you can shut me up, because I, I, it doesn't matter because I'm here to glorify Christ. And I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop until the day I die. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul, Paul discovered that life will bring you joy, contentment, and fulfillment when that life is a life in service to others, when it's a life with a kingdom perspective. Jesus said the path to lasting joy is, is a path less traveled. That's a paraphrase, but in Matthew chapter 7, he said, small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Which means you won't encounter that much competition along the way. 
But what you will encounter is a peace that surpasses all understanding and unspeakable joy. I encourage you today to measure your life by what you're able to do for others and those things that will last forever. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that by your spirit and the power of your word, that you would change each and every one of our, our perspectives. And that when we see things from a different way, it would change the way we live and bring even more glory and honor to you. As we continue praying and reflecting on these words that you've given to us, Lord, some of us this morning are facing obstacles, challenges, and things that we don't necessarily understand. And I pray that you would open up our eyes to see the big picture, to see beyond our own viewpoint and, and to desire to have a godly perspective. Those of you here this morning who would, who would say, I, I want to see things the way God sees them. I want to think the way that he thinks. If that's your prayer this morning, if your prayer is, God, help me to see things from your viewpoint. Help me to have your perspective. Help me to think like Jesus thought so I can live like Jesus lived. If that's you this morning, if you really want to have an attitude like Jesus, to think like Jesus thought, and I, and I know it's a really big prayer, but to, if you want to live like Jesus, would you just lift your hand high right now? Would you lift your hands high all over the place? God bless you all. God, I, I thank you for all those who are hungry to have the mind of Christ. God, I pray that you would give us the ability to take every thought captive anything that's not from you or consistent with your, your word of truth, that we would recognize it, that we would grab that thought and make it captive to making it obedient to Christ. God, I pray that you would give us the ability to think on those things that are pure, that are admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. God, I pray that you would give us the ability by the power of your spirit to have minds that are renewed, that we wouldn't conform to the patterns of this world, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. God, I pray that you would, you would plant these truths deep within our hearts. That we, we don't just come here to serve, but we, we're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That it's not about self-promotion, but it's about giving of ourselves. It's about abandoning self. That our, that our joy is not based on what happens to us, but it's based on you, on your presence, on what you're doing in us and through us. And so, God, I pray that we, that we would learn by the, by the power of your spirit and by the truth of your word to think like Jesus thought and that you would help us to live like Jesus lived, all for your glory and for your name. And as our, as our worship team comes up, maybe this morning you recognize that, that your perspective has been all over the place. That as you, as you examine yourself, you know, things are all messed up. and You, re you recognize that you're, you're far from God, far from his perspective, far from understanding his ways. If that's you this morning, and you would, you would, you would say to God, I, I need his forgiveness, I, I need his presence, I need his grace. If you recognize this morning that you sinned, and you need, you need his love and his forgiveness in your life, if that's you, I encourage you to respond to him this morning. To recognize that it's not about you, but it's all about him. And to lay down your life. To lose your life for him. To lose your life in him. So you can find his life in you. If that's you, I encourage you to come forward for prayer.